Hello. Um, we are here representing Technology Will Save Us, which is a haberdashery for technology and alternative education space in London. But we're actually here representing a much larger family of, of organizations that are actually committed to enabling the skills, the tools, and the understanding to actually become more productive participants in technology rather than just consumers of technology. And we're going to talk a little bit about the influences that have brought us there and um, the kind of world we want to shape with these kinds of skills. So technology is the great enabler of creativity, uh, but in the process it also changes the creative act. Um, as Marshall McLuhan said, we shape the tools and the tools shape us. And today the tools shape us more than ever. Uh, we can create movies using iMovie, uh, we can create photos and different montages using Photoshop, but there's a built-in aesthetic to these tools. There's, it, we have this, all this potential, but we have this limitation at the same time. And uh, we have to think to ourselves, who puts these limitations on us? Uh, these tools, with this built-in aesthetic, they have their own idea. Uh, engineers have built them, designers have built them, and they've sort of bootstrapped us up to the point where we can start creating from a very high level, but they haven't really thought about uh, from the ground level. And people really want to get down to the ground level. They want to get down to the nuts and bolts of technology and start creating from scratch. Um, there's a great tradition of this. If I can get my clicker to work. It's a great tradition of this in uh, art. If you start off in the turn of the century, we had Marcel Duchamp. And he was making these machines that were art. They were these kinetic machines with motors built into them. They had spinning disks that would form different configurations. Really beautiful op art machines. Uh, following him was Jean Tingley. And Tingley was creating these machines that could do drawings. They were automatic drawing machines. They were machines that made art. And they were so successful that a museum in Stockholm was actually able to buy another machine using the proceeds from a machine's drawings. Okay, so they sold enough drawings to actually make a fair amount of money. Uh, Tingley soon realized that he wanted to create things on a scale that he just couldn't achieve as an artist by himself. So this piece here is called Homage to New York. Uh, he went to New York, he found out a couple of artists and engineers, uh, a couple of engineers called Billy Kluver and Fred Waldauer. They were down at at t Bell Labs, based in New Jersey. Uh, Billy had a background in film and in art, you know, art enthusiast. And he helped him build this thing. It was a self-destroying machine. It must have been pretty fantastic. It went down the streets of New York. It had a piano inside it that burst into flames and exploded. Uh, bicycle wheels that just flew off into the distance. It was really something. Um, so they, these engineers helped him achieve their scale. And out of this, Billy Kluver formed in Fred and two artists, Bob Whitman and Rob Rauschenberg. And they decided to form this group called Experiments in Art and Technology. And the idea was they were going to take the artists and they were going to take the engineers and they were going to start a conversation between them. They were going to collaborate and change both of these practices through different projects. They put on a number of shows. Uh, one of them is called Nine Evenings. And Nine Evenings was this fantastic group of artists. Uh, you had John Cage is there on the left with his Variation 7, which was done to Fred Waldauer. On the right, you have Robert Rauschenberg's open score. And between the two of these guys, they, they just invented all this technology, like wireless sensors and uh, you know, contact microphones inside of, inside of tennis rackets that would turn off the lights when they were hit. So pretty soon, EAT realized that you know, they're having some success in the art world, but they really needed to move on and, uh, and get to the general public. They really wanted to spread this creative spark out to the entire world. Uh, they were doing all these singular works of art, but it just wasn't catching on. So they pitched a bunch of ideas, they pitched ideas to government and industry, but by the 1970s, there was a bit of cynicism involved. Uh, the artists were kind of losing faith in industry and government, they couldn't really achieve the work on a scale that they wanted, and the industry, on the other hand, was really just looking for like, they, they wanted great works of art, art from artists. They really weren't interested in this kind of broad social communication. So, in the end, uh, they were in some ways unable to unlock the poetry within people, as Bob Whitman said. And this mass movement, this critical mass, never really caught on. So though the critical mass didn't really catch on uh, with this sort of artist working with technology to sort of push the state of the art, 
uh, some of the things that do catch, did catch on was when the industry put these technologies into the hands of consumers, and consumers were actually able to start working with them, making them theirs, their own tools. So we all know, of course, uh, the wonderful world of the desktop computer. We went from the ENIAC, a building scale uh, computer, which you needed a PhD to control, to something that you just needed to be able to afford to buy by going into your local store. Then we have something like, uh, we all remember our favorite digital watch back in the day. Well, uh, you know, digital watches, what does that mean? Well, we had mechanical watches, they were portable uh, technology. But then you put a digital chip inside there, you can start doing things like recording data. Add a calculator to that, and soon we're going to have cell phones inside of them. Incredible. But it's a really important moment when we started having multifunctional mobile devices, which I think Mark or somebody earlier on mentioned. Um, then, of course, we have the mobile phone, and of course, we know about, all about the mobile phone. It went from these you know, really big, heavy battery packs, which were mobile, to, well, a desktop computer sitting in the palm of your hand. And that's not where it will end either. Very soon these technologies are going to pepper our landscape. They're going to, we're going to have the most incredible computing power all around us. So what all of this shrinking down of technology has done is it, it's made technology fully accessible to anyone, to everyone. So you, in, in, in the developing world, you'll find market stalls on high streets selling components, electronic components to reuse, refurbish, fix, etc. cetera, uh, mobile phones or any other kind of technology. Uh, in the developed world, of course, you can buy the, the components online. They're fairly cheap uh, and they come the next day delivery. Um, but the result is that we see these devices that may not actually be super useful uh, that get produced and uh, put into the hands of consumers. And one of those devices was this lighter that I found. You light it, a flame pops out, and an LED turns on below it. A lighter with a flame and an LED. Good thinking, guys. Anyway, but some of the other results is what happens is our consumer behavior changes to a point where we convert our desire for things into our need for things. So we must have that thing. It just came out. It's awesome. So the last one I had just gets put into a drawer with the last few years' versions of the same device, and they start gathering dust. And we probably all have that sort of dust pile sitting in one of our drawers or cupboards. Um, the reason for this is because these technologies are not intended to be opened up, reused, refurbished, etc. You just have to buy the next one. Uh, some of the other sort of uh, negative results of this is that things then, the unintended consequence is things don't end up in our backyards, but other people's backyards. We have the Great Pacific Trash Vortex on the left-hand side, which is this space more than the size of uh, Texas. Some of you have probably heard about it. it um, it's just trash been floating into the ocean and gathering in this huge gyre in the middle of the Pacific Ocean. It's, it's insane. Then on the right, we have this amazing photo by a South African photographer, Peter Hugo, uh, of an e-waste processing space in Nigeria. And this gentleman in the photo, was uh, he, he'd be breaking down the devices, getting to the, the, the uh, plastics and, and metals, burning off the plastics, getting to the most valuable commodity, which is the metals. And that's how the recycling process would take place. Not our backyards. But it's not all negative. There's actually a lot of really positive things happening as well. And that's the, th the world we want to be a part of shaping as technology will save us, as open lab workshops. Um, there's this big movement from consumer to producer. Bethany touched on this and other people have mentioned it throughout the day. This idea that we don't just want to be told what to buy or we don't just want to buy everything we need. We actually want to start producing those things ourselves. Uh, we want to reskill ourselves. And you know, if you build your own house, I think you're more likely to want to fix things, be a part of it. It's a shame to leave it. You know, it's something that's a part of you because you left a part of yourself inside of it. That's an important thing to experience for people. From master craft, taking things that, again, we're being told what we should be buying. But actually, nowadays, with Etsy and other, other sort of websites and spaces, you can start choosing the artisanal pro products, the things that are very specific to your own interest. From uh, black box to exposed beauty, taking these devices that we're told they're awesome, they're amazing, and there's a new one coming out in a year's time, opening it up, giving you access to it, making it into a totally new and wonderful device, making it into a musical instrument, even if it was meant to be a, a cell phone. Wonderful opportunity there. From waste to resource, eBay, yeah? One man's waste is another man's resource, Craigslist. Uh, there's one in the UK called FreeCycle. Uh, amazing. I have things that I don't need, but I don't have to throw them away. I can just give them to somebody who could reuse them, do something more useful with them. From closed to open, it's not just about sort of devices. It's also companies. 
companies are thinking to themselves, well, if we become a bit more transparent in what we do, perhaps people will be more willing to be interested in what we do. So opening their own processes up to their consumers, uh, using more open source technologies, contributing to those technologies, it's a really positive thing. And then, of course, from offline to online, from uh, this challenge that Evan alluded to, where the artists just wanted to try and create a critical mass around pushing technology forward. Well, it's possible now at the click of a, of a mouse. It, it's amazing how accessible we have, we can, how, how accessible communities are. We can mobilize them super quick. So what that means is things like Arduino and processing exist thanks to these amazing communities. They are helping shape the tools that we use, that we need, in fact, to share this world that we want to be a part of. So I'm, I'm just going to share a few examples of, of workshops and things that we're doing to actually help to encourage the shaping of these kinds of shifts in the world. So these images are from a very particular workshop that we did. Um, we do a lot of pop-up spaces. We try and bring these skills to high streets, to the, to the kind of everyday existence of how we live. So we did a pop-up shop in a place in London called Whitechapel, which some of you might know is an incredibly diverse and eclectic area. There are literally hundreds of people from different cultures living in a very small space. And we intentionally didn't market to our traditional kind of network. We wanted to see how a real community would respond to these kinds of needs. So we offered really accessible workshops. We offered five pound soldering classes, drop in soldering classes, and meetings with an expert. So people could actually come in and have a discussion with an expert to understand certain needs or build certain solutions. So some of the images we have represented here, um, we had a really amazing woman come in who is a Caribbean rapper. And she came in and basically sold her own musical instrument that she then used in a performance that she did kind of later that week. Um, we had lots of people that came several times. So the gentleman in the image with Daniel is Mr. Lewis, who is an 87-year-old man living in the community. Um, he didn't need soldering classes. He knew how to solder. That wasn't what he wanted. He actually had a very specific need. He tore out his doorbell, brought it to the space, and told us that he essentially was deaf and that he couldn't hear his doorbell when he had guests. And he asked us to help him hack it, to put an LED in the doorbell so that he could actually see when he had guests and not miss guests. And of course we helped him and we did that. And of course what we learned from that was one man's need in that community might be someone else's need. And that started to really help us understand that a physical space that offered these kinds of workshops, these kinds of skills and the support could actually help to unleash a kind of creativity in people that just might not be accessible to them right now. Oops. Some of the other workshops we do. Um, this series of workshops is more about the scale of workshops, the kind of the, the, the breadth of workshops that we do. So things as simple as wiring a plug. We hold workshops where people actually learn how to wire a plug. To some people, electricity is this mysterious thing that is really hard to understand. So we do workshops on wiring a plug, and actually, for some people, it's quite transformative. We also do workshops slightly more advanced, like DIY speakers. So the image on your right, on the top right-hand corner, people learn how to solder an amplifier, actually attach it to things called exciters, which then turn any material into a speaker. They then learn about sound through materials. So putting it on wood creates a very different sound than putting it on glass. And we actually explore materiality in sound. People then construct their own speakers out of recycled material, whether it's cereal boxes or really large pieces of styrofoam we find on a street. So they actually create something quite useful and quite exciting while learning about sound and a new skill. Um, we do advanced skills as well, like using the Arduino platform for interactive lighting workshops. And then we do things with family and kids to really encourage people to kind of take apart things, see disparate objects as, as components and put them together to actually make devices and make things. So in the end, what we're really trying to, to, to push, <laughs> sorry. Technology will save us. <laughs> it will. <laughs> there we go. So what we're really trying to accomplish is we think this hacker approach, this hacker mentality to life, to problem solving is a really powerful thing. Being resourceful, looking and appreciating at the materials and the tools in our life in a slightly different way, understanding those things in a different way can actually unleash a creative spirit and a, a kind of confidence in prototyping and building things that we think is really powerful. And if the people that come to our workshops leave with that approach, we think that's a really powerful thing. If they never solder again, which I hope some of them do, that's okay because approaching all different forms of knowledge from science 
to everyday problems, we think this is a really powerful thing for people to do. Thank you very much.